Genesis chapter 1, one of the most controversial passages man has ever written down. Many have puzzled over this text. What does it mean? Why was it written? And what were the authors intending to say? But if we're going to be honest with ourselves, if we want to know what this text is saying, we need to try to understand it in its original culture and language. There has been a plethora of interpretations that have been offered to try to explain what Genesis 1 is saying, and I do not pretend to be doing anything different here. However, I feel many in the past have not factored the cultural context into account when reading Genesis, and this has led many trying to interpret the text through their own cultural lenses. This really is not a fair assessment of the text. We constantly want to force Genesis into our own cultural norms. And the hard reality is, the culture of the biblical world was different than ours in many ways. The first assumption we have is our understanding of what something is or what makes something a thing. This seems so intuitive, we hardly question that another culture might have viewed this differently, but the evidence suggests otherwise. When we describe what something is, we begin by describing its properties. But in the ancient Near East, Something existed if it had a function. How the ancients would describe something would be to describe what its functions were. As scholar John Walton says, People in the ancient world believed that something existed not by virtue of its material properties, but by virtue of it having a function in an ordered system. In this sort of functional ontology, the sun does not exist by virtue of its material properties or even by its function as a burning ball of gas. Rather, it exists by virtue of the role that it has in its sphere of existence, particularly in the way that it functions for humankind and human society. Consequently, something could be manufactured physically, but still not exist if it has not become functional. The evidence for this can be seen in other ancient texts from the surrounding cultures. Ancient Near Eastern creation myths typically begin with when, signifying the story begins at a point in time, not at the beginning of time. They also tend to speak of the gods and the earth coming out of watery chaos, assuming there is a state of matter that exists prior to the creation account. They don't really seem to care about where the pre-existent chaotic matter came from the accounts seem more concerned with when the gods turned chaos into order. For example, the Enuma Elish begins not by saying which material things came into existence. The text is quite devoid of these claims. Instead, it focuses on assigning roles and how chaos was turned into order. It begins with noting the heavens and the earth were not named, the waters not divided, yet already existing, no field or marsh had been formed, and the gods had not been called into being. John Walton points out the original language is quite devoid of material creation, and it is very easy for us, reading it in English, to want to force onto the text material creation in certain places. But this doesn't seem to be the purpose of the text, or what the author's main focus was on. Instead, the purpose of the text is explaining when the gods turned the chaotic cosmos into an ordered world where civilizations could begin. This is an account of functional origins, not material origins. With that in mind, we need to remember this is the cultural background for the biblical world, as Michael Heiser says. You do realize that the context for understanding the Bible is not the Protestant Reformation? It's not the Roman Catholic Church. It's not 20th century or 21st century evangelicalism. The context for the Old Testament is the context that produced it, which we don't have anymore. We have vestiges of it. We have memories of it. We need to keep these basic points in mind when we read the biblical texts. Understanding their cultural background can shed light on how the texts was understood to an ancient audience. 
However, when Genesis 1 is translated into English, it is often done without its cultural context and trying to force it to fit our cultural expectations. This makes Genesis 1-1 sound like it is expressing an absolute beginning point, like what we would expect to be the case with a modern creation account. But Biblical Hebraists are not convinced of this reading. Michael Heiser has indicated that the Hebrew Masoretic vowel points and the wording of the Greek Septuagint do not imply that Genesis 1-1 should contain the phrase, in the beginning. There is a clear lack of a definite article in the Hebrew, so the opening line of Genesis should actually be translated as when, not in the beginning. At first it doesn't seem like much, but this simple change has drastic implications. For one, it transforms verse 1 into a dependent clause. Instead of it reading as an independent clause, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It reads, when God created the heavens and the earth. This makes verse 1 a dependent clause on verse 2, and theologically, it indicates that when God showed up to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was already formless and void. Thus, Genesis 1 would not be indicating an absolute beginning for all things, but a point in time when God showed up to initiate a specific change upon the earth, namely transforming it from a state of being formless and void. Of course, young earth creationists might reject this by pointing out the original Hebrew didn't have vowel points. So we can't use that to indicate how the original authors read verse 1. However, the argument can be made from the Hebrew grammar and usage elsewhere. First, John Selhammer has pointed out the Hebrew word for beginning typically refers to a duration of time rather than an absolute point of time. He draws attention to Job 8.7, which uses the same language to refer to the early time period of Job's life, and Jeremiah 28.1, which refers to the beginning period of Zedekiah's reign. In Judea at that time, the king's first year did not begin with his accession to the throne, but later on the first day of the coming new year. Prior to the new year, the king would reign up to the point under a preliminary period of time. Jeremiah, in this passage, is referring to the preliminary time period of the king's beginning reign, and the same language is used in Genesis 1-1, supporting the idea of the verse refers to a temporal duration instead of an absolute beginning point. Selhammer notes this supports an extended period of chaos prior to Genesis 1-1, when God showed up to transform the earth from a chaotic state to an ordered state. Second, Robert D. Holmstead, in his doctoral thesis, says that an absolute beginning cannot be derived from the grammar of the verse. Instead, the syntax of the verse based on well-attested features within Biblical Hebrew grammar, dictates that there were potentially multiple periods or stages to God's creative work. Holmstead identifies that Genesis 1-1 has a similar grammatic structure to other verses that are restrictive relative clauses. Restrictive relative clauses are dependent in nature. In other words, they are not a complete thought. And this means Genesis 1-1 is most likely dependent on verse 2 and lacks a definite article to signify it should begin with the phrase in the beginning. Third, this actually makes Genesis 1 cohere more with how ancient Near Eastern creation accounts begin. Verse 1 is seen as a stage setting prepositional phrase for what follows, a dependent clause, followed by verse 2, a circumstantial clause, and finally arriving at verse 3, the main clause. As Ben Stanhope says, this formula was the customary way to open a creation account, as it is the same structure in the Enuma Elish, the Atrahasis, a Syrian Car 4 tablet, and the creation account of Adam and Eve beginning in Genesis 2 4b. So Genesis 1 should be understood as a dependent clause, and God's first creative act doesn't begin until verse 3, when God says, Let there be light. Genesis 1 1 doesn't imply an absolute beginning of time, but like other creation accounts from that time, begins with the implications 
there was an unknown amount of chaotic time prior to God's creation week. Next, we need to go over the issue with the word we commonly translate as create, bara. If Genesis 1-1 is a dependent clause and not the first creative act, that would mean God shows up when the earth is already formless and void. So why does verse 1 say God created the heavens and the earth when the earth was already formless and void? John Walton notes the word bara doesn't necessarily refer to creation as in material manufacturing but it is better understood in terms of assigning functions or giving a purpose to. As we noted earlier, it is most likely true that the ancients thought existence depended on function, even if something may have existed prior in some chaotic material form. Naming and assigning something a function brought it into existence within the ordered system. Kenneth Matthews notes bara refers to God bringing about a new activity not necessarily a new thing. Examples which show this are places like Psalm 51, where it says, Create in me a clean heart. It is not about asking for a new material heart, but God assigning one's desires a new function. Isaiah 57:19 speaks of God assigning praise upon the lips of Israel. And the whole context is about God transforming the mourners of Israel, not creating them out of nothing, Isaiah 65 refers to Jerusalem being assigned by God to be a place of delight. There are places where bara could mean material manufacturing, but it's never a necessary reading. For example, Genesis 5.2 refers again to how God created them male and female. But Walton notes the Hebraic syntax more refers to them being assigned the roles of male and female within a marriage, not necessarily a material creation. Thus, although bara could at times be referring to material manufacturing out of nothing, it is not a necessary reading anywhere in the Hebrew scriptures. And yet, there are times it necessarily has to be referring to assigning functions. In light of this, Genesis 1-1 seems more to be about God naming or giving functions to the heavens and the earth. Similar to the opening line of the Enuma Elish, when things were not yet named. So in light of the revelation that verse 1 is a dependent clause and would signify God showed up to create the heavens and the earth when the earth was already formless and void, all the authors are saying is God was barahing, naming, or assigning new functions to the heavens and the earth. Creation then takes place by giving things order, function, and purpose which is synonymous with giving them existence. This actually fits far better with the expression of the earth being formless and void, which are the Hebrew words tohu and bohu. We translate this as formless and void, but that doesn't really capture the Hebraic meaning of these words. David Samura has done a full semantic analysis on the term tohu, and his conclusion is in Hebrew, the term most likely means unproductive. Bohu only appears in the Hebrew about three times and is always in conjunction with tohu. However, tohu appears about 20 times and it is used to refer to a wilderness, idols that accomplish nothing, a wasteland where caravans perish, people wandering aimlessly, a desolate settlement, or the northern kingdom after it was destroyed by Assyria. The context of how the word tohu is used seems to suggest it refers to an unproductive state or a wilderness where there is no human production or ordered civilization. Thus Genesis 1 only seems to be saying that before God began to cause the earth to function properly, it previously was not and was something more like an unproductive wilderness. This seems to make more sense with what follows. As we read in Genesis 1, of how God began establishing specific functions for all the things he assigned. For example, in verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness night. Well, why not just call the light what it physically was, namely light? Instead, God calls the light by how it functions on earth, namely to be for the day, 
and the darkness is to function as night. On day four, we see the great and lesser lights are assigned to mark the seasons, days, and years. Their functions, not material creations, are what brings them into existence or into the realm of the ordered system. J. Richard Middleton notes, these two examples of creatures in 1.6 and 1.14 to 18, whose existence is explicitly defined by their function or purpose. DGA Kleins notes the existence of the firmament is in relation to its purpose. And we can see similar ideas throughout the rest of the text. The waters are assigned to function as seas, the dry land is to function as earth, and to bring forth vegetation. Once the Hebrew words are properly defined, the whole passage can be seen as God assigning proper functions, and thus bringing them into existence within his new ordered system. Using the same logic, we can see why the creation account is divided into seven days. The use of seven was a typical cultural symbol for a temple inauguration. The construction of the tabernacle in Exodus 40 was completed in seven stages. The ordination of a priest is seven days. Solomon's temple was constructed in seven years and dedicated to God during a seven-day festival on the seventh month. Even Solomon's dedication speech was given in seven petitions. Outside of the Bible, we find this as well. The Gedea cylinders speak of a seven-day temple dedication, and Ugaritic texts speak of Baal completing his cosmic temple in seven days. The point being the seven days in Genesis 1 seem to favor a more functional understanding of the whole passage. The temple and the tabernacle were constructed from pre-existing material. The materials were simply organized to function properly in the worship of the Lord. Given that we see God as properly assigning functions to creations in Genesis 1, and how they will operate within human civilizations, the most likely explanation is the text is simply establishing that God entered into a chaotic universe and assigned functions to various creations as part of setting up the whole cosmos as his temple. It's not about material manufacturing, but about establishing the cosmos as his temple and properly ordering things to work for culture or society. John Walton gives a good example. He says to picture a closed down restaurant and then one day renovators turn it back into a functioning restaurant. All the materials were there. It just lacked people to use them properly to create a business. The same basic ideas can be seen in Genesis 1. God doesn't manufacture new materials like we commonly assume, but is simply establishing how each thing will function for human civilization within the created order in order to establish the cosmos as his temple. This is also apparent in the order of days. Commentators have noted for years how the six days of creation are a mirrored structure. Day one has the light being made and day four has the luminaries being made. Day two mentions the sky and the ocean and day five mentions the animals therein. Same applies to days three and six. Richard Hess has pointed out the ancient Hebrews suggested spiritual life occurred in three concentric spheres of intimacy with God. For example, the camp of Israel was seen this way. In the center were the priests in the tabernacle, then in the outer circle, the whole encampment of Israel, and then finally, in the outermost circle were the pagan nations and the chaotic wilderness. Animals were also divided into three sets with the sacrificial animals in the innermost circle, then the clean animals for the encampment of Israel, and then the unclean animals in the wilderness. The creation account of Genesis 1 seems to be using the same theology, divided over the six days of creation, symmetrically divided into three sets. In the outermost circle are the luminaries, then the sky and the sea and the animals therein, and finally in the innermost intimate circle with God, are humans and the rest of the land animals. In other words, the authors of Genesis 1 are using the seven days in Genesis in two ways, one being a symbol for a temple inauguration, and then two, dividing the work between six symmetrical days to explain that the cosmos, which is now God's temple, 
has been divided into three spheres of intimacy. As John Walton says, days one through three, which concern the three core functions of the cosmos, time, weather, fecundity, would consequently be viewed as not just activating, but establishing the control attributes of the cosmos, while days four through six could be seen as determining the destinies of the functionaries within the cosmos. All in all, I think we need to take a hint from Brandon J. O'Brien and E. Richards. The ancients didn't care about chronological order as much as we do. And when we constantly try to read the days of Genesis 1 as a literal chronological order, we are doing a disservice to the texts and their cultural norms. The authors don't seem to be writing in an exact chronological order, but a symmetrical order in a poetic form. Day 1 and Day 4 are meant to go together. To the original authors, light appearing before the sun would have been just as ridiculous as it sounds to us. So let's review what we have so far. The opening lines of Genesis 1 seem to imply an unknown time period of chaotic wilderness that was unproductive, not an absolute temporal beginning. God enters into this chaotic state of the universe it begins to order and assign proper functions to things as to how they will operate for human societies, like how the sun and moon will be for determining seasons and months. In doing so, God transforms the cosmos into his cosmic temple, much like how one can turn a rundown restaurant into a functioning restaurant just by coming in and using things properly. Three spheres of intimacy are set up as standard Israelite temple or tabernacle theology runs. And finally, it ends with God resting or taking up residence in the cosmic temple. Genesis 1 isn't really about material manufacturing unless we force it to be via an English translation. The account is more about establishing order in a chaotic universe for human societies to thrive with God at the center. To further back this up, there's an interesting passage in Jeremiah, which uses very similar language to suggest the reverse of Genesis 1 took place. Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26 is an account of what happened to the Northern Kingdom of Israel after the Assyrians took over. And it's a warning to Judea that they will soon follow suit if they don't shape up. However, the account speaks of the opposite of what happens in Genesis 1. Now Israel is without form and void tohu and bohu. There is no light, there is no man, there are no birds in the air, and no vegetation to give fruit. If Genesis 1 is about the material creation of all things, we should expect the same language, in reverse, to be the disintegration of the material spoken about. However, when Assyria conquered Israel and deported all the elites, we don't suggest a fabric of space-time ripped open and the land of Israel popped out of existence. Instead, we understand the kingdom went from a productive, functioning society to a chaotic land. The light from the sun literally did not stop shining on that region. It was just part of the cultural expression to say the kingdom went from an ordered society into disorder. And thus, the reverse in Genesis 1 would only suggest that God took a disordered cosmos and ordered it to be a functioning temple for himself and the humans therein not the beginning of all matter as we know it. Now for those who might be troubled by the idea of Genesis 1 not being about the material creation of all things, I'll remind you there are clear verses in the Greek New Testament which affirm God is the creator of all things in a material sense as well. As writers in a post-Aristotelian world were asking these questions. However, this was not on the mind of the Hebrew authors who didn't really care about such questions. Ancient Near Eastern and Egyptian creation accounts didn't really care about where matter, space, and time came from. They all opened, presupposing these things already existed in some chaotic state. They were more interested in questions of order, purpose, and function. What they were asking in their writings was when did God, or the gods, take the chaotic waters and transform them into the ordered system that we now live in? When we try to impose a materialistic understanding onto Genesis 1, we are really doing a disservice to the text. 
we ought to do our best to let the text speak for itself, instead of trying to impose on it what we expect or want it to say. The reality is, scientific questions that we are asking today were not on their minds, and there is no reason to read that into the text, or assume scientific theories that we have today are in contradiction with Genesis 1.